Hello and welcome back again to a brief history of time chapter and part number six of this wonderful book that we have been summarizing. If you are new here, I have been making episodes for each chapter in this book and summarizing it in a beautiful poetic way. And we have now reached chapter six. I will put all of them in this playlist so you can go back and actually see and follow up. If you're reading the book, you can watch these episodes along and you're going to find them so much more interesting and everything will be on one playlist, which I will also keep in the description. Today's episode, I know a lot of you have been waiting for this one because it discusses a very interesting topic for people that enjoy physics and even laymen, people that don't really have to do with science or physics, and that is the subject of black holes. So without any further ado, let's just go right into the subject and actually summarize this chapter. To talk about black holes, it is very interesting to understand two things. And that is light and also gravity. Because there is a relationship that is going to be very important when discussing black holes between the nature of light and also gravity. So let's talk about light for a little bit. Throughout the history of physics, the nature of light and what light is has been nothing short of interesting and at times also controversial. The problem with light is for a long time we didn't know what it is. Some people and there were some theories that suggest that light is actually a particle, a tangible particle, and one of those people was actually Isaac Newton. Other people thought that light is actually a wave. And what's really interesting and peculiar is that there is strong evidence for both. The people that say that light is a particle and also the people that say light is a wave. There's equally strong evidence for both of them. Of course, we now know that light is a photon and it has properties of both. Particles and also waves. And this is known as duality in physics. We say that light is dualistic in nature. It can behave as a wave, but it can also behave as a particle. The reason this is important is because there is a question, which is, how is light affected by gravity? And the answer would be, depending on the nature of what light is, that if light was actually a particle, then it would be a mass and masses are attracted by gravity, just like planets. It would be affected just the same way the moon and the earth are affected by the sun. But if light was a wave, then that wouldn't be the case. Here's what's interesting. A photon has no mass. So if the photon has no mass, then it shouldn't be dragged by gravity just like that. So then if light is actually a particle, how is light affected by gravity, right? A long time ago, people thought that light has infinite speed, that it can go with speeds that are unlimited. Of course, just like we spoke about in an earlier episode in this series, Romer discovered that it actually has a finite speed, a very specific speed, which is of course now we know as the speed of light. Romer even tried to measure the speed when he was observing the moons of Jupiter and the times they were appearing. His conclusion was that light actually has a finite speed and is not infinite in speed. If it was true that light is actually infinite in speed, then it would explain how it doesn't get affected by gravity as a particle because it is so fast. But of course, it does have a limited speed, which is the speed of light. Now, John Mitchell has proposed and published a paper that has very interesting ideas. Mitchell suggested the existence of a star that has so much gravity that it can drag so much back into it. And he suggested that what if we had a star that has light that comes out of it and before it could get so far, the gravity of that same star actually takes back the light and it attracts it right back into the star. So the light from the star is attracted by its own gravity. Such an object and such a star is essentially exactly what a black hole is. Now, what John Mitchell described here is an object that cannot be seen. 
And the reason it can't be seen is because the light that's coming out from that star cannot get to us. This is how vision works, of course. Light reflects off the object into our eyes and then our brain interprets it. It tells us what we can see right now and this is how sight works. So if there is an object like a star that emits light but the light never gets to us, then by definition this object is invisible. So John Mitchell suggested that there could be so much and so many of those stars around the universe but we're not going to find them because we can't see them. Laplace also had similar ideas in some of his works and publications, but those disappeared in his latest publications for reasons that are unknown. So we now basically know what a black hole is. Back to the question, how is light affected by gravity? A consistent theory about that did not actually develop until Einstein came up with his general relativity. When Einstein created general relativity, basically it was a reframing and he told us that we should kind of look at gravity in a completely different way. Instead of thinking about gravity as a force, he defined it as a consequence of the existence of the fabric called space-time. So basically there's this fabric called space-time and the existence of a mass creates warps and distortions in that fabric. And the fact that planets and objects fall and move into these distortions in the fabric, this is actually what we interpret as a force. And this is Einsteinian gravity. Using this definition of gravity or this way of looking at gravity, it means that the way gravity affects light is by making light, instead of going in a straight direction, it actually moves into the curve. So imagine if there's like a slope that goes down and light would be moving forward and then when it reaches that slope, it just sort of drags down and follows the curve of space-time. Now that we have an idea about how does light affect gravity and what are black holes, there is a very important question. Where do black holes actually come from? To understand where black holes come from or how they form, we need to understand how stars form and the life cycle of a star. The way stars like the Sun are born is this. A massive cloud of gas in space, mostly hydrogen, which is abundant in space, starts to come together and collapse because of its own gravity. As it does this, the hydrogen atoms come so close to each other and start to collide with each other faster and more frequently. When this happens, this creates heat. Then they get so close together that they start to actually coalesce together and form helium. This process is called fusion. The energy from this fusion is what keeps the star hot and glowing. This energy also causes the gas to counteract the gravity and actually expound outward like a balloon. A star, like the Sun, has enough balance between the gravity, pushing it closer together into its center, but also the fusion energy inside it, keeping it together. This is just like when you are blowing up a balloon. The air you blow inside the balloon makes it expand and go outward. But the latex, or the rubber, the balloon is made of, pushes the other way and wants the balloon to get smaller and remain tight. So then, what about a black hole? A black hole doesn't have that balance and instead has overwhelming gravitational field. So powerful that even light cannot escape. And light, of course, being the speed limit of the universe, it means that nothing else can escape from this black hole. This is what a black hole is. With work from Lando, Chandrasekhar, and Oppenheimer on black holes, as well as advancements in technology, there was a lot of work being done in that field of astronomy. Now, Oppenheimer's concept of a black hole was very interesting, and I'm just going to explain to you the way he thought about it, or his thought experiment, real quick. And this is the reason we have this board right here, and I'm just going to explain this very quickly. So, what I want you to imagine is that we have here... A black hole. So this would be representing a black hole. 
and in here we have a source of light. So with a source of light I want you to imagine this cosmic space laser shooting device or something. <laughs> anyway, just a device that emits light, okay? So Oppenheimer was saying this black hole has so much gravity, right? So if light coming from here is moving this way, it just keeps going straight. But if this light was a little bit closer, it will get a little bit deviated because of the gravity of this black hole. So it's getting slightly deviated and moves this way. If the light beam was even closer, we'd get even more deviated like this and more affected by the black hole as you can see. And the closer it is, at some point it goes into the black hole and it never escapes. You see one, two, three, those have actually escaped even though they're affected by the gravity, but there is a point, there is a line where if anything crosses, including light, which is incredibly fast, will never escape the black hole and it just gets sucked right into the black hole. Now this thin line where if anything crosses, it gets sucked into the black hole is called the event horizon. The event horizon is the line between outside of the black hole and into the black hole and if anything crosses or touches the black hole, the event horizon, that's when it gets sucked into the black hole because of its own gravity. This is Oppenheimer's thought experiment about that. A lot of people have been working on general relativity and also this new model of gravity altogether and they are making a lot of publications about that at this point. Among the people who contributed to the field is obviously the author of this book, Stephen Hawking, and he writes about this in the book, but also he did this uh, amount of research before he passed with Sir Roger Penrose. These two gentlemen together came up with this. They predicted that there must be a single point, a singularity, in the middle or a center inside of a black hole where the laws of physics completely break down. And you hear physicists say that. Now, what this means is that what applies in outside of the black hole stops to work and reality just changes. Basically, time doesn't exist anymore, which means any equation that makes use of time just becomes disposable and not useful at this point. Now, this is protected by what Sir Roger Penrose called the Cosmic Censorship Hypothesis. And in simple terms, it only means that if someone is standing outside of a black hole and someone is standing somehow inside of a black hole, the laws of physics may break down completely at the singularity, but only for the person inside of a black hole. So for the person outside of the black hole, nothing changes. It only happens at the singularity inside of a black hole. Of course, it is summarized in a sentence that you hear a lot of physicists say, and it is, God abhors a naked singularity. Now that we discussed black holes, how they affect light, and also how do stars actually form, and how do black holes form, how do we know black holes actually exist? What is the evidence for black holes? Do you remember what I said in the beginning? If there's an object that emits light but the light never gets to you, then it's by definition impossible to see. So how is it possible for you to find an object or say that there's an object that you've never seen? How can you find an object that you can't see? There are a few evidences that we're gonna run through, but what I want you to keep in mind is because I'm summarizing this book right now, some of these evidence will be from this time. So there could be new evidence for black holes after this book has been published. Obviously we have much more evidence, but I'm just gonna mention some of the ones that are mentioned in this book. Now, first of all, it is true that we can't see a black hole from a distance, but here's the thing. Just because you can't see a black hole, it does not mean you cannot feel its effect. It's possible that we don't see it, but we can notice the effect caused by its gravity. 
As John Mitchell pointed out in his pioneering paper in 1783, a black hole still exerts a gravitational force on nearby objects. Astronomers have observed many systems in which two stars orbit each other, attracted towards one another by gravity. They also observe systems where there appears to be only one star that is orbiting around some unseen companion. One cannot, of course, immediately conclude that the companion is a black hole, but it's something to keep in mind. Also, in 1963, the Dutch astronomer Martin Schmidt measured the redshift of a faint star-like object in the direction of the source of the radio wave called 3C273. He found that it was too large to be caused by a gravitational field. If it has been a gravitational redshift, the object would have to be so massive and so close to us that it would actually disturb the orbits of the planets in the solar system. This suggests that the redshift was instead caused by the expansion of the universe, which in turn means that the object was a very long distance away. And to be visible at such great distances, the object must be very bright, must, in other words, be emitting a huge amount of energy. The only mechanism that would produce this amount of energy seemed to be a gravitational collapse of a whole central region of a galaxy, which is the gas collapse we talked about forming a black hole. Further encouragement for the existence of black holes came in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And this is about objects in the sky that were emitting regular pulses of radio waves. At first, Bell and her supervisor, Anthony Hewish, thought they might have made contact with an alien civilization in the galaxy. <laughs> How exciting! Indeed, the author of this book, Hawking, remembers that they called the first four sources to be found LGM, which standed for Little Green Men. In the end, however, of course, they and everyone else came to the less romantic and exciting conclusion that these objects, which were given the name pulsars, were in fact rotating neutron stars that were emitting pulses of radio waves because of a complicated interaction between their magnetic fields and surrounding matter. Finally, observations with the Hubble telescope of the galaxy known as M87 revealed that it contains a disk of gas 130 light years across, rotating about a central object 2,000 million times the mass of the Sun. With these given conditions, these can only be a black hole. So those were some of the evidence, like I said, explored in here in the book. It is a very good idea if you are reading this book to watch this series along. I think it's going to help you have these concepts uh, instilled in your head and it's going to make everything more interesting and it's going to make the book more fun for you to read also. This has been chapter 6, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this. I want you to put a like, share this video, and subscribe to the channel because I'll be making more videos and also we're going to continue this series. Let me know what you think. Discuss. If you have any questions, put them down. Make sure to join me for the next chapter because we've just finished talking about black holes. And the next chapter is titled... Black holes ain't so black.